The phone rang sharply next to the sleeping Terry Gilson. He woke up abruptly. What the heck? He growled. The phone rang again. He picked it up. Hi. He murmured in a serious low cough. Mr. Gilson? Yes? This is Sergeant Preston from the Yukon County Police Department. May I speak to Mrs. Servey? Bellowed an authoritative voice in Wilson's ear. Who's that? Mr. Gilson? Please connect me to Mrs. Turvey. This is a police emergency. Again, the clear and demanding tone. A minute, Gilson muttered. He handed the receiver to the bare woman lying next to him. For you, it's the police, he said simply. What? She snatched the phone out of his hands. Hello. Good morning, my dear unfaithful wife, came the overly chipper greeting. I hope you slept well last night after you and your lover finished having fun. My God, Mick. Mick, is that you? You can rest assured, sweetheart. I just called to give you some information you'll need. Mick, Mick, please. She tried. First of all, you can throw away your house key. It doesn't work anymore. Also, I changed the code on the garage door opener. Mick, please. It's not what you think. She cried. You do not know what I think, Sheila. But I didn't call to discuss it with you. I called to tell you that your credit cards won't work anymore. And you can pick up your clothes and toiletries in the plastic tubs behind the side gate any time you want. The voice turned as cold as ice. No, no, Mick, please do not do this, please, my wife pleaded desperately. Too late, lovelies. I've already done it. But where shall I go? She cried. Well, in the immortal words of Rhett Butler, frankly, my dear, I do not give a darn. The tube slammed shut in anger. I had started this process weeks ago, but this particular morning was the defining moment. If I hadn't been so sure she was sleeping in Wilson's room, I wouldn't have even tried the trick. I was surprised at how easily it had worked out and how empty the moment had seemed. A couple's victory, I thought. Too little, too late. I suppose that's appropriate to describe my situation. My name is Michael McDarby. I am 43 years old, and I work as a sales representative for a building materials company. I have been with this company for over 20 years. I married Sheila Pratt almost exactly 20 years ago. We were to celebrate our 20th anniversary next month. I considered the marriage a success, for we had two wonderful children. Our first Angela, my angel, was born a year and a half after we were married, and then our son was born two years later. I loved my wife and children unconditionally. They were the meaning of my existence. No man could be prouder of his family than I was. We lived in a modest home, but it had everything a family could want. The three-bedroom split level was our second home, purchased four years ago. It wasn't new, but we made an effort to update it and make it our own new kitchen. Then a finished basement with a workshop for me and a large family room that the kids could use for their entertainment. A garage where we actually parked our cars, and then new furniture for the living room and dining room. I felt like we had the perfect life. I met Sheila when we were both students in 11th grade. She was a pretty blonde with a nice body, so it wasn't hard to notice her. She tried out for cheerleading, but was unsuccessful. I played receiver on the soccer team and thought we might make a good couple. I asked her out right after school started in the fall, and she said yes. We had been dating for a few months, and in that time Sheila had matured into a very beautiful girl. I wasn't the only one who noticed. I thought we were dating, but never seemed to confirm it with Sheila. The next thing I knew, our quarterback, Terry Gilson, asked her out, and she said yes. I couldn't understand that. I thought we were a couple, but apparently I was wrong. Gilson was the star of our team. He was a big, talented high school senior with a strong arm and a will to win unlike anything I had ever encountered as a quarterback. He was a coach's dream and a coach's nightmare. He had tremendous talent and fearlessness, but he just couldn't follow orders as the rest of the team realized. Terry was not a team player. Terry was just Terry. Our team finished that season with a winning record, but I wondered how much better we could have been if Terry had stuck to the coach's script instead of making it up as he went along. For all his talent, he was undisciplined and very frustrating for all of us who worked in his shadow. Terry often bragged about entertaining every cheerleader at least once. I was grateful that Sheila wasn't a cheerleader, but I wasn't sure that would protect her. There was no point in my being angry at Gilson. He was what? He was a ruthless womanizer. 
He viewed these young girls as meat on his plate and intended to enjoy them. I was hurt that Sheila had fallen in love with him, but I knew there was nothing I could do about it. Terry would be gone next year, and Sheila and I would still be here. Maybe I still had a chance, but it didn't happen. I started dating Marilyn Ehrlicher since seating at our school was alphabetical most of the time. Marilyn most often sat behind me and had me in her sights. Marilyn was a nice girl, but it wasn't what I was looking for. I wanted something more exciting, but that was asking too much of Ms. Ehrlicher. We got along fine, and I think she was impressed that a soccer player was interested in her. But that was about it. In the spring, I started looking for a replacement. Meanwhile, Gilson had dumped Sheila in favor of some other girl, and she was available again. I thought about it, but given the way she dumped me, I decided to ignore her. By the end of the year, she had found someone else, and I was on the sidelines again in 12th grade. Things were different. Roger Davidson became the quarterback of our team, and he turned out to be something. Terry Gilson was not. He was a leader and a better team player. He looked to us to determine who could do what. I thought more than once that this guy could make a coach. He understood what it took to win and to get the most out of what the team had to offer. The result was great. I was catching passes like never before, and we were winning regularly. When Roger would go into the huddle, he would be quiet, tell the play, and make sure everyone knew how to act. This was all new to me, and I loved it. I continued to avoid Sheila. My ego still hurt from my affair with Gilson. I wasn't really surprised when Roger started dating her. For all his talent and leadership, he was a quiet guy, and it was hard not to like him. Oddly enough, I was fine with them if I couldn't be with her. Roger was my choice. I think she felt the same way. Sheila wasn't the smartest girl in school. In fact, she scored an average C average, and like many of her classmates, got a job. She never had plans for college. She must have realized her limitations. She took a job as a bank teller at the mall. After high school graduation, I lost touch with her. I was on my way to college and already dreamed of playing soccer, drinking beer with the boys, and dating only the prettiest girls who would aspire to be with the soccer hero. By Christmas, reality set in. I failed three classes, and while I enjoyed every minute I spent on the soccer field, the rest of my campus experience was not so enjoyable. There was no line of girls waiting to go out with me. Beer was downtown and expensive for my limited budget. Classes were a torment, and it was hard for me to realize that the learning process was solely up to me. There was no one to monitor me and make sure I was attending class or completing assignments. It was a very different world. The grades posted on the board at the end of the semester were disappointing. I was in danger of dropping out. Well, I said to myself next semester, no soccer and no girlfriends. I might as well do this. It wasn't easy. It was a whole new way of life for me. It was a struggle. I made it through, but not by much. With a year of college under my belt, I wondered if this was what I wanted to do for the next three years. If I asked that question, I thought the answer was obvious. No. I found a job in an office in the city, and every morning I would get on the bus, work my nine hours, get on the bus again, and go home. After a few months, I realized that this couldn't be my future. I needed something more. I lasted almost two years, but I was constantly looking for something better. If you asked me what my career path would be when I graduated from high school, I would have no idea. I certainly wouldn't include the sales category in my mind. A salesperson is someone who goes door-to-door -door selling brushes, kitchen utensils, or magazines. That's definitely not me. I got a different perspective when I saw what industrial sales was all about. You had to know your product and show people that it was a good, if not better product, than the one they were using, and then convince them to buy it. More importantly, the technical side was something I could get passionate about. It didn't take me long to realize that sales is a strategy. What do you have that the customer needs? Why would he want to buy it from you? I applied for a transfer to one of the operating branches and was given the opportunity to work in sales. An inside job. That was the beginning. And the more I saw, the more I realized that this was what I wanted to do. I went to work, still without a car and living at home. When I moved to the operations department, nothing had changed. I was a newcomer with a small salary, 
and I traveled to and from work by bus. When I received my first paycheck, I decided to open a bank account. Until then, I had been living from paycheck to paycheck, and that was about to change. For convenience, I chose a bank near the bus stop and walked in. As I approached the customer service counter, I stopped in my tracks. The young woman who was soon to serve me was named Sheila Pratt. I was a little worried, but since I had a few more people ahead of me, I had a chance to calm down and think about what I wanted to say. I hadn't seen her in three years, but as much as I studied her, she was just as beautiful as I remembered her. It didn't take Sheila long to take care of the people in front of me. And then it was my turn. Hi, Sheila, I said, stepping forward. She obviously didn't know I was standing in line and was surprised to see me in front of her. Hi, Mick, she said after a moment's pause. What can I do for you? I'd like to open an account. I need to deposit my paycheck into it. Of course. Let me get one of the staff to help you, she said, smiling. Yes, thanks. It's good to see you again, I offered weakly. Yeah, it's good to see you too. The smile was genuine, it seemed to me. A week later, I went back to the bank to pick up my blank printed checks and saw Sheila again. This time, she was walking down the street, I realized, delivering mail. I watched her as I stood in line and wondered what was going on in her life. There was only one way to find out. After picking up the box of checks at the service counter, I looked around for Sheila and saw that she was standing behind the side counter, obviously not doing anything. I walked over to her. Hello again, I said, smiling. Hey, how's it going? She asked. Her smile was the one I remembered from when we were dating. She was sincere, honest, and very attractive. I'm fine. I work at Polar Industries now. I work in sales. I offered. Well done. Do you like him? Does he have a good future? She asked, seeming interested. Yes, I like the company and the products it represents. I think I'm lucky. Good, Mick. I'm glad to hear that. Sheila, would you like to have coffee with me or something else? Hesitantly, I asked. We could catch up. Sure, that would be nice. I'll be free in a few minutes. Why do not you wait for me and we could go to the coffee shop next door? She suggested. Great, I said with a wide smile. I'll be waiting out front on the bench. Thus began our reunion, and within a few dates, we were back where we were. I was 21 years old and just starting my career, and Sheila was looking for a husband. I proposed the following spring, and she accepted. A year later, in May, we were married, and we were both excited about our future. A year and a half after we were married, Angela was born. She was a daddy's girl from the moment she was born. When she was little, if she was upset or crying, I would pick her up in my arms. She would calm down, smile at me, and all was well again. I always thought I wanted a son, but Angie was everything I could have wished for. Our son Ben was born two years later, and I was as happy as only a father can be. Sheila was Ben's special parent, and I was Angela's special parent. It was the perfect family, I thought. Sheila often told me the same thing. She was happy and content with our lives, she told me. We had our moments, but they never lasted long, and I knew I was lucky. I had a wonderful wife and two wonderful children. Right after Angie was born, I was given a sales territory and was on cloud nine. I fell into the job like a duck into water, and within a couple of years, I was earning almost double what I started with. Success breeds success, and now I was earning much more than I expected when I started at Polar. Five years later, we were able to buy our first house. It was a small bungalow, but it was all ours. Sheila spent hours leafing through magazines looking for the right things. Angie and Ben contributed too, but it was Sheila who chose the decor and colors. I just stood in admiration of how my family had come together. We celebrated our 10th anniversary at the same house, and over 30 people came to the anniversary party. I was proud of my accomplishments, but I was even more proud of my family. My children were well-behaved and excelled in school. My wife was an exemplary housewife and mother. Both parents believed that the sun and moon revolved around us. What more could I want? When Angie turned 14, she started menstruating. At first, Sheila was happy to help Angie understand what was happening and how to deal with it. Things went well for a few weeks, and then I noticed a change. 
Angie didn't seem to be as close to her mother as she used to be. It wasn't an obvious change, but to me, close to my daughter, it was noticeable. I could not find a reason for this change in attitude, and discussing it with Sheila proved frustrating. She did not want to discuss or even acknowledge this change. She claimed it was my imagination and a man's inability to understand female psychology. I was still concerned, but since the rest of the family didn't seem to be affected, I let it go. Ben always seemed to be on guard. He and his mother were very close, and although I loved him as much as Angie did, I knew that if there was a serious problem, he would turn to his mother for help first. That didn't bother me in the least. All families form alliances with their parents, and they should have been recognized and respected because of my success. I continued to climb the career ladder, and while I realized that sales management was probably not what I was cut out for, I wished I had at least been offered the opportunity. I had my most productive and profitable territory, and I wondered what it would take to take the next step. It finally dawned on me that in order for such an opportunity to arise, a position had to be filled. Shortly after Angie entered high school, Sheila came to me and asked if I would mind if she went back to work. She had been a stay-at-home soccer mom for 16 years and felt like she wanted something to do besides washing, ironing, and sewing. I couldn't think of a single reason why not, but asked her to make sure that whatever she chose would not interfere with the children's lives and our ability to enjoy free time together. She assured me that it would not interfere. After a few months of searching, she found a job at a car dealership as a receptionist. It was not full-time, and that suited us both. She had to work there in the mornings from 9 to 1, Monday through Saturday. Since I was playing golf on Saturday mornings, I figured that schedule would suit me just fine. It didn't pay much, but we didn't starve, and her extra earnings could be used as vacation pay. If it suited her, it suited me. Our life continued for a couple more years, until one day, Sheila came home with a disturbing message. You know what, Mick? She said, not without some trepidation. What? Terry Gilson is back in town, she said, watching my reaction carefully. What brought him back? You know, his father is a big businessman. Terry is now the assistant general manager at his father's dealership. She said, still not as nonchalant as she wanted to seem. And what kind of dealership would that be? I asked, knowing full well the answer. Ah, I mean, where I work, Century Ford, she stammered. So what does that mean to you? I asked, starting to see something else creep into the picture. I'm going to be. I mean, I've been asked to to take him on as an assistant, she finally mumbled. Wow, that's a big step. From part-time receptionist to assistant, to the assistant to the assistant general manager. I didn't realize they had such a large staff. I'm sure my tone was sarcastic and I didn't try to hide it. Something you're not very happy about, she remarked. No. You dated Gilson? I've played with him. We both know what kind of guy he is. He bragged about all his conquests. Is your name still on his list? It was a cheap shot, and I realized it as soon as it sounded. That's terrible. Are you telling me you do not trust me? She demanded. I had to move. No, I'm telling you, I do not trust him. Her face flushed red, and for the first time in a long, long time, she was very angry. Take that back. You have no right to accuse me of anything. And what's more, you just said I cannot be trusted, she muttered. I made no such statement. I said I didn't trust him. I said... We both know what kind of snake he is. It may have been twenty years, but leopards do not change their spots. I made sure she understood that I wouldn't back down an inch. Just ask yourself this, I continued. How can a part-time secretary go from entry-level employee to assistant to the boss's son in one step? I'd like to know, I demanded, because I have the talent for the job. She snapped back. Terry said I was just made for it. You do not think I have the ability, do you? She challenged. I do not know. I do not work there. But one thing I do know is that this whole deal smacks of typical Gilson. He's setting you up, and you'd better be very careful, my dear. Now, I was standing right in front of her. She couldn't help but understand my misgivings and suspicions about Terry Gill, since motives, I could only hope that my message had reached her. You're jealous. You do not want me to succeed, because it will make you look bad. That's the thing. You're jealous. She scoffed. The argument was going nowhere, 
and she wasn't listening. I sighed heavily, turned and went down to the basement for a cold beer and some time to think. I had no illusions about Jill since motives. He had seen an attractive woman he thought he could get without much effort. What did it matter if she was married? He probably remembered me from high school and didn't think I was much of a nuisance. I would keep a close eye on the situation of that, I was sure. It was a week before we returned to calm water in the house. My argument with Sheila was unfortunately overheard by our children. It was hard not to hear as we both raised our voices. As always, when things calmed down, Angie came to me when I was alone. Hey, Dad. Are you okay? Hey, Angie. Yeah, I'm fine. I lied. I couldn't help overhearing the argument, she admitted. Who is this guy? Gilson. The one your mom dated in high school. He was our quarterback, and I played with him all year. I tried to warn your mom. He's not a very nice guy, and doesn't have much respect for women. I said sadly, I do not think you were telling mom what she wanted to hear, she said softly. No, I think not. I think she sees this as a big opportunity and an important job. She'll probably go from part-time to full-time. So I guess there will be some changes in our routine, I suggested. It's okay, Daddy. I can help with the food and laundry and stuff. I think she'll be making a lot more money now. Do not you? Probably. We haven't gotten into that. I'll just have to wait and see. Angie, I hope this doesn't turn out to be a big mistake for your mom. I said, putting my hand on her shoulder and pulling her to me. I just hope everything turns out okay. As I suspected, it was a full-time job, and the pay was more than double her previous earnings. So, in that respect, she was being rewarded handsomely for her role. However, I had my doubts about the job. When I cautiously asked Sheila what she did during the day, she answered vaguely, but what I heard sounded very unstructured. If I interpreted what she was telling me, it appeared that she had to resort to when Gilson called. As time went on, I became less and less concerned about her work. She left for work a little before nine every morning and came home shortly after five in the evening. No overtime, no special assignments, just routine work. As a result, we didn't have to sacrifice much. My workday was longer than hers, and I was often home after six leaving in the morning at seven. I wasn't home before anyone was up and so my family time was limited to evenings and weekends. Our love life was never what I would call hot. It just wasn't Sheila. Even though we did it, usually a couple of times a week, it was plain vanilla stuff. I tried to get her interested in other things that were a little different, but she just wasn't interested. Since we were doing this twice a week, I couldn't complain. After Gilson came along, I kept a close eye on the changes in our love life but there was nothing unusual about it. We were doing pretty much the same things we'd been doing before. I've always tried to get along with my neighbors. It's a lot easier to live that way. The McDonald's on one side of us were quiet people and quite elderly. Their children had grown up and moved away, and we didn't have much in common with them. We were polite and helped each other if needed, but otherwise, we weren't close. The Romanos who lived on the other side of us were very different. Their children were younger, and Angie often babysat for them the first few years we were there. We got along very well with them, and often had backyard barbecues and card parties at each other's houses. Jimmy and Felicia were probably our best friends. Jimmy was an accountant, and worked at the big GM dealership in town. I had already forgotten about it, but when he drove home a rented van with the dealership's name on the side, I remembered one late Sunday morning Jimmy was mowing the lawn before mowing, and I walked over to him for a moment to talk. Hey, Jimmy, how's it going? I began. Well, you know, the usual stuff. I think it's okay. He grinned. Yeah, same thing. Say I have a question for you. I tried to make it sound casual. Shoot, you work at a large dealership. Does the general manager usually have an assistant? I mean, assistant general manager? Yes. Big dealerships usually have someone to back up the boss when he's not around. Well, this assistant have an assistant like, say, Friday's girl. He looked at me strangely, and then I saw a few lights come on. His face got funny, and he looked really uncomfortable. Not usually, he finally said. I didn't think so, I said, nodding. Thanks, Jimmy. I turned and headed back to the house. My suspicions were confirmed. Mick, he called out to me. I stopped and turned around as he came toward me. I know what you're thinking. I have some acquaintances there. 
Let me see what I can find out about. Cute, he said in a low voice. I stared at him for what seemed like a very long time, then nodded. Thanks again. I'm not sure why after all this. I asked Jimmy that question. Maybe I was afraid of the answer. There wasn't the slightest hint that anything was going on. But I suppose the thought had been on my mind. And still is. Jimmy knew who Sheila worked for and what her position was, but he never said a word about it. I just dumped him, and he reacted the way a good friend should. Even though Sheila was no longer working on Saturday morning, I continued to play golf early in the morning. The Saturday following my conversation with Jimmy was cool and windy, but at least it didn't rain. I played with our usual foursome, and none of us played very well. The wind intensified the cold, and none of us were very comfortable. We were all happy to finish the round and get to the clubhouse, as we usually did after the changeover. We would meet at the 19th hole, and the winners would toast the losers. Today, my partner and I were the winners. As I walked into the lounge, I saw Jimmy Romano sitting alone at a table by the TV. He was sipping a drink, so I approached him. I didn't know you played golf, I said with a smile. I do not. You know me better than that. He laughed. What brings you here? I asked almost guessing the answer. I wanted to talk to you alone, he said, suddenly. Serious? I nodded. I was sure that was it. Give me a minute to settle with the winners, and I'll be right back. I promised it didn't take me long to buy drinks for the boys, and explained that I had to excuse myself to meet someone. Five minutes later, I was already sitting at Jimmy's table. So I can only assume you heard something about my recent question, I said, leaning back in my chair. Yeah, I wish the news was better, Mick. I really wish it was, he said sadly, hardly looking me in the eye. Give it to me straight, Jimmy. I can handle it, I said with more confidence than I felt at that moment. Gilson is probably the most unpopular guy at this dealership. People I've talked to consider him a leech on the side of the business and completely useless. He goes around and pisses off everyone he encounters. He has nothing to do because no one wants him to do anything. He'll just screw things up as he's demonstrated many times before. Jimmy stopped and sipped from his glass. No surprise there, I said, trying to remain calm. So where's Sheila? He looked at me with the most haggard look I'd ever seen on his face. He really didn't want to tell me what he was going to tell me. Sheila sits in his office, most of the day, occasionally typing letters and bringing him coffee. The only time she asks fast is when old man Gilson shows up and she quickly disappears into the parks department or the employee break room. When the old man leaves, everything goes back to normal. Jimmy says, I guess old Gilson doesn't know about Sheila and her mysterious work, I said sullenly. Jimmy only nodded. Then he paused, and I realized there was more to it. Spit it out, Jimmy. I won't bite, I promised. The two of them go out to lunch about twice a week. They leave just before noon, and do not come back until 2 or 2.30. Since she's been there, said I finally shocked. No. It started a few months later, he suggested. One day, one of their slick salesmen followed them. They went to the Carlton Hotel on Banner Road. That's a long way to go for lunch, I suggested Mick. There's no restaurant at the Carlton, he said in almost a whisper. I felt everything inside me clench. I was locked in place, unable to move. I could hear my intermittent breathing, trying to get my thoughts in order. Although I suspected this might happen, I wasn't prepared for it. I cannot remember how long it took before I was able to form a coherent thought. I'm sorry, Mick. I really didn't mean to be the guy who he muttered. I know, I whispered. Hopefully. I didn't want to hear it either. We had another drink with Jimmy and reminisced about the good times our families had spent together. There were many happy memories but it felt like we were saying goodbye to each other in a way. I think we both realized now that things would never be the same again. I could feel that pain in my gut, and it hurt. I drove home, preparing to see Sheila, and pondering how I was going to handle this revelation. I had been strangely calm with Jimmy, and it seemed odd that I would be able to handle this devastating news. I tried to imagine any scenario that would make their afternoon visits to the Carlton anything other than sexual but I realized it was unlikely what was on the surface was still there. It wasn't until I was halfway home from the golf club that I started to get angry. 
My head was spinning with a thousand random thoughts all at once, and my emotions were in turmoil before it all started to boil down to one horrible fact. She had cheated on me, and cheated on me, many, many times. I was a fool, even though I knew the possibility existed. She made a fool of me, and didn't even blink an eye without feeling the slightest sense of guilt. Day after day, she made me a cuckold. It was then, with that realization, that the anger began to build. I pride myself on being rational and not prone to rash behavior. I pulled over to the curb a few blocks from my house because I knew I was in no condition to walk into my house and confront Sheila. Moreover, it wouldn't be the smartest thing to do. In fact, I was pretty sure it wasn't. If I thought it was just a one-time fling, I could get over it and we could move on with our lives. But it wasn't. Apparently, it had been going on for a year. All this time, Sheila had been playing the role of a happy housewife with a loving family. It was a deception of a very high order, sitting in my idling car. I decided that this called for a very high order of payback. I will act as normal as possible, but on Monday, I will start the process to end this farce and get my revenge. I am determined that I will cause Terry Gilson and Sheila Pratt Turvey as much harm as possible. I will act according to the rules and the law, but I will do everything I can to bring them both down. The rest of the weekend passed with excruciating politeness on my part. I was tight-lipped, not allowing my anger and frustration to spill out onto my family. There was plenty of time for that when all the pieces of the puzzle fell into place. I counted the hours until Monday morning. When Monday finally came, I got up earlier than usual and left the house well before seven. I knew I had a few hours before I could get started on my problem, but I wanted to get out of our house as soon as possible that morning. I knew that my sales manager, Larry Coleman, was already in the office, and I needed to talk to him about taking some time out of his day to address my problem. Our conversation took over half an hour. I knew he had guessed what might be going on in my family life when I explained what I wanted in terms of a vacation. And thankfully, he was receptive and agreed. He was a nice guy, and I enjoyed working with him. Just after nine in the morning, I called David Murphy, our family lawyer, and asked for advice on a family matter. I knew it was not his specialty, and was not surprised when he referred me to Lydia Park Rats. I had met Lydia in passing once or twice, and had heard she was a very good divorce attorney. She wouldn't be cheap, but at this point, the expense was the last thing on my mind. That afternoon, I had an appointment with Lydia for late afternoon. I knew I would be late, so I called home to leave a message. Angie answered the phone, which surprised me. Hey Angie, what are you doing? Home teacher professional development day, she said with a touch of mockery. Ever notice they're always on Fridays or Mondays? Yeah, I noticed. Look, I have an appointment late tonight, and I won't be home until 7, I think. Let Mom know, okay? Sure, Dad. Say, are you okay? She asked with curiosity in her voice. Yes, of course. Why do you ask? I do not know. You didn't seem like yourself this weekend. You weren't sick or anything, were you? No, I lied. There's nothing wrong with me. You must have an overactive imagination. I laughed. We signed, and I hung up the phone, wondering if Sheila had noticed my unusual behavior. She didn't say anything, but maybe she was being cautious. We'd have to watch for that. I didn't want to tip too soon. Meeting Lydia came as a shock to him in many ways to begin with, regardless of the reason. Sheila got half of everything in the divorce. The house, the cars, everything. The only good news was that her income was such that I probably wouldn't have to pay alimony if I could prove infidelity. Judging by her reckless behavior, I doubted I'd have any trouble getting proof. As for the children, I would have to prove abuse, neglect, or some other horrible crime to get custody in this jurisdiction. Children were almost always given to the mother. Angie was 18 and could make her own decision, but Ben was only 16 and would have to spend almost two years with his mother. I felt bad, but Lydia said I probably couldn't change anything. That's just the way the system works. That's when things got interesting. Lydia knew of my overwhelming desire to punish both Sheila and Gilson, and she said she could help. Since Gilson was her boss, I could sue both him and the company. He worked for his co-defendants in the divorce case, 
In other words, since so many people knew about their little game and did nothing to stop it or report it, we could sue them for a very large sum of money. Better yet, none of that money would go to Sheila. Lydia said she would make inquiries about Century Ford and begin the paperwork for the divorce proceedings. At this point, the reason for the divorce remained open. I was to decide whether it would be irreconcilable differences or infidelity. Lydia suggested that since their liaisons were so predictable, it would not be difficult or expensive to get some photographic evidence to solidify case. I told her I would think about it when I got home that evening. A happy Sheila greeted me, informing me that my dinner was already in the oven, and she poured me a glass of wine. I was immediately suspicious. Such behavior was unusual for her. I went upstairs, changed my clothes, washed my face, and went down to dinner. When I sat down at the table, Sheila sat down too, also with a glass of wine. I have some interesting news, Mick. She began with a broad smile. I've been invited to the regional dealer convention next month in Marysville, she said proudly. Really? Just you? I asked, almost knowing the answer before I even asked it. Well, no. Terry and Kurt Jenkins are going too, she said with some nervousness. I see. And how long does this convention last? Three days. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I'll be back on Sunday. Now the nervousness was fully evident. Sounds like you're looking forward to it, I quipped. Yes. This will be my very first convention. I'm sure I'll learn a lot. She changed in an instant. Now she had that happy enthusiasm in her again that she had a moment ago. Yes, I do not doubt it, I replied with slight sarcasm as my mind picked up on my emotions. I began to realize that this could be opportunity I was looking for. She almost set herself up to be caught. So you're okay with that? She asked uncertainly. Yes, dear. I do not mind. I trust you. I know you won't do anything inappropriate. I said with a straight face as I could muster. I saw the blush on her face for only a moment before she stood up, leaned across the table, and kissed me. Thanks, Mick. I finished my meal in silence, and Sheila went back into the living room to watch some mindless TV program. I found it strange that I wasn't upset or angry or anything. I was numb. I had just let my wife out of town for three days and have fun with some butthole I hated, and I felt nothing. The next two days went fine, just normal. I got through my work, but my mind was a mess of thoughts, and I wondered how it was all going to turn out. I started thinking about Ben and Angie. What would they think? How would they react when I destroyed their mother? Would they hate me? I couldn't think of a way to protect them from what I was about to do other than to call the whole thing off and let Sheila continue doing what she was doing. Deep down, I knew I would never let that happen. On Thursday morning, Lydia called me at the office and asked me to meet her in the afternoon. We set the time for three, and I arrived early. I wanted to bring her up to speed and start the process. I made a few decisions. Lydia, something interesting happened on Monday. Sheila told me that she's been invited to attend the regional Ford dealer convention in Marysville in three weeks. It won't surprise you to learn that she'll be going with Terry Gilson and another guy from their office. I paused, waiting for her reaction. You're right. There's no surprise at all. My sources say the whole thing was set up a long time ago. I guess she finally got up the courage to tell you on Monday. She said calmly. Yes. Monday? How did you know? I asked with a smile. Well, it's a trade secret, but let's just say she's not as smart as she thinks she is. Lydia grinned. I've decided we should try to get some pictures. Will that allow us to file an infidelity report? I asked. Yes, definitely. Now we know they use the same room in the same hotel every time. That's silly. My friend is getting some photographic evidence this week, and that should be enough to make the case. But that's not all. She grinned. I looked at her satisfied smile and waited for the next news. Century Ford is owned by Terry Wilson's father, Knox Gilson, as you probably know. I know there is a morals clause in every employee's contract, and this will make our additional lawsuit much easier. In fact, it will be a piece of cake. She smiled slyly. How much do you think we can get them for? I asked. Feeling an evil streak awakened in me. Well... We'll probably get half 1,000,000 to 1,000,000, but of course, we'll ask for a lot more. 
God knows Father Terry can afford it. She laughed. I really like the sound of it. I guess the only bad thing is the kids. I can protect Angie, but I cannot do anything for Ben. I said, suddenly realizing how fast things were moving. I know. And there's not a darn thing I can do about it unless we get a judge who thinks Sheila's scum. We're going to have to live with it. I'm sorry, but I wish it wasn't so. She said with genuine pity. All right, Lydia. Thanks for the shovel job. I'll let you know when and where the convention will be held, and what hotel she'll be staying at. In case your boyfriend cannot find out anything before then, I'm tired. This whole mess had taken all the strength out of me. I wanted to go home and go to bed for a week or three, hoping it would all be over by then. Of course I knew it wouldn't be. There was still a long way to go. I managed to get through the next three weeks without arousing Sheila's suspicions. Maybe she wasn't paying attention. Or maybe she was just so sure of herself that she didn't worry about it. On the eve of her departure, she had packed and carried her suitcase and travel bag to the front door, preparing to leave in the morning. She had no idea what this weekend had in store for her. When I got up Thursday morning at my usual time, Sheila was already up and eating breakfast. She was definitely anxious to get going, and she was pacing nervously around the kitchen. "'You're up early?' I remarked coolly. "'Yeah, I just wanted to make sure everything was taken care of before I left.' Do not worry about it. Angie will take care of the housework, and I'll help her on the weekends. I take it you'll be home Sunday morning, I offered. I'm not sure if it will be in the morning or afternoon. We'll have to wait and see. It's Terry's car, so I'll let you know, she said hesitantly. She avoided my gaze. She knew what she had to do, but she didn't want to look me in the eye and admit it to herself. She couldn't know that there was no getting away from this weekend. Have a good time and behave yourself. I said without a fraction of sarcasm. She gave me a brief glance, then continued her uncoordinated activity. I couldn't remember ever seeing her so nervous. Perhaps she sensed the change in my attitude and was afraid I might recognize or suspect something. I couldn't tell. I finished my coffee, kissed her lightly on the cheek, and left for the office. All day I wondered if she thought I knew something. It might ruin my surprise, and that would really upset me. I didn't tell Lydia or anyone else what I planned to do. Early Sunday morning, upon arriving at the office, I called Lydia and she quickly got on the phone. Lydia, can you confirm that we have pictures of Gilson and Sheila in action? I asked quickly. Yes, we have them, but I do not think you'll want to see them. Maybe after this is over. But for now, just let us deal with it, okay? She spoke in a muffled voice, and you couldn't tell from her tone that she wasn't happy. I had to assume that the pictures were going to be quite denigrating. The only good thing about it was that it no longer mattered whether my little stunt on Sunday morning had worked or not. The matter was now settled. Are all the divorce papers ready? Yes. We can serve it when you say so. I have a little surprise for her on Sunday morning, so I think we can serve her at her parents' house on Monday morning. Can I confirm that on Sunday? I asked. Yes, but Mick, you're not going to do anything stupid, are you? There was concern in her voice. No, absolutely not. I won't do anything to mess this up, I promise. I hoped my statement was reassuring to this dynamic lady. I didn't want anything to ruin my plans. Good, I'm glad to hear that. Take care of yourself, Mick. I know these are hard times for you, but they'll pass, and you'll move on. I know it, she said sincerely. Lydia, I couldn't have done it without your help. The only thing that remains difficult is telling the kids on Saturday about what's going on. I'm not looking forward to it. I admitted, I'm sure you do not. Good luck. If you need anything, call me or David. Okay. Thank you. I signed quietly, hanging up the phone. I thought about telling the kids that night, but changed my mind. One of them might decide to call their mother and warn her. I wanted to minimize that risk. Sheila called around eight that evening and her voice was very chipper. She enjoyed the convention and the various booths. She had a nice room, and the restaurant served very good food. She talked to me briefly, but spent more time on the phone with Angie and Ben. She gave us her room number, 1228. When the kids went to bed at the usual time, 10 o'clock, I waited until I was sure they were asleep, and then called the hotel and asked for room 1228. If Sheila answered, I would just say goodnight and say something nice to her. 
The phone rang at least seven or eight times, but there was no answer. I hung up. Sheila called Friday night again around the same time as before. We had a brief conversation, and then she talked to Angie and Ben. She spoke differently. Perhaps the excitement of the convention had passed, or maybe something else. On Saturday, she called early, just before six. Luckily, we were all home. Once again, our conversation was short and not very personal. She was going out to dinner with a large group, and according to her, wouldn't be home until late. I was not displeased. I was relieved when Angie, Ben, and I sat down to dinner. The table was very quiet. We all seemed to be immersed in our own thoughts. Finally, I realized that I couldn't put it off any longer. We cleared the table, put the dishes in the dishwasher, and I turned to them both. Kids, I need to talk to you about something, I began. Ben and Angie looked at me, and I sensed they were guessing what this was about. There's no easy way to say this, so I'll just tell you what's going to happen. I reached into my pocket and pulled out two shiny new house keys. These are your new keys to this house. The only person who has them is me. Your mother is not coming back to our house. I finally forced myself to say. Angie gasped. Ben's eyes widened and his mouth opened. For the past year, your mother has been in an affair with her boss, Terry Gilson. She betrayed me. You and her marriage vows. I can no longer live with her and will not allow her in this house. I paused. Daddy, no, Angie cried. Why did she do that? I do not know. But to be completely honest, it's not the most important thing on my mind right now. I know it's going to hurt you. There's nothing I can do about it. She has been with Mr. Gilson at least twice a week for the last year. That's over 100 times. My anger started to come out, and I saw Ben wince slightly. This convention she's attending. It's nothing more than a smokescreen. So they can be together for the weekend. Well, they're not fooling anyone, I spat. Dad, what's going to happen? Asked Ben, still shocked by my statements. I've filed for divorce, and your mother will be served with the papers as soon as she gets back into town. There will be some other things happening with Mr. Gilson, but you do not have to worry about them now. I will let you know about them as they happen. I paused again. I'm sure they must have been shocked by my comments over the last five minutes. Does this mean I'll never see Mom again? Asked Ben, on the verge of tears. No, I wouldn't do that to you, Ben. I know how important she is to you, and I wouldn't do that. Maybe you'll live with her from the beginning when you're 18, like Angie. You can see both of us any time you want. Angie, you can decide where you want to live. It will be your choice, I said, looking into my daughter's sad eyes. That sucks, Dad. It's splitting the family. It sucks, she said with tears in her eyes. Yeah, I know. Unfortunately, it's the courts that make those decisions, not me. I thought long and hard about it. I suppose I could tell your mother everything I know and just get on with my life. But I couldn't do that. I have to admit, I'm very, very angry with your mother. She lied to us. She lied to us. I do not think I could just turn the other cheek. I admitted. Ben turned, walked quietly up the stairs to his room, and closed the door behind him. He's in shock, I thought. I'll go up and sit with him in a little while. When he's had time to realize what's about to happen. I turned to Angela, and she looked at me, sadly, then stepped toward me and hugged me. I'm so sorry, Dad. I know how much it hurts. I cannot believe she would do it again. She cried. I threw my head back and stared at my daughter again. Angie nodded, lowering her eyes. Tell me, please, I said quietly. It was four years ago. My period had just started, and I was having trouble getting my period. One morning when I was in class, started having severe cramps. I went to the nurse's office and she sent me home with a note from my mom telling me what to get when I walked into the house. She, she, and Mr. Morissette were sitting on the couch. I must have screamed and ran upstairs to my room. I heard them talking and moving around, and then the door slammed shut. A few minutes later, my mom came into my room. At this point, Angie broke down and the tears began to pour in earnest. What happened next? I had to be patient. I had to let Angie tell me in her own way. Mom said if I told you or anyone else, you'd get divorced and I'd never see you again. She said the courts always give custody to mothers 
and you'll be so mad at her that you'll probably move out, and I won't see you at all. She looked up at me and shook her head. I was scared, Dad. I believed her. I couldn't lose you. Not then. Not ever again. I guess I promised Mom I wouldn't tell anyone except Ben. I never told until now. I put my arms around her again and pulled her to me. That conniving jerk had used Angie's love for me, against her, and blackmailed her into silence. So Gilson wasn't the first, and he wasn't the only one. I began to wonder how many there could have been. How could I have been so stupid? How had she managed to pull all this off without me suspecting a thing? Had I been so stupid that I hadn't noticed what was happening? Or was she smarter than I gave her credit for? Angie, I do not know what to tell you except that I love you. I will do everything in my power to be a good father. No matter what happens in the future, you're old enough to make your own decisions. And I want you to know that whatever decision you make, I will support you. And it won't change my love for you. I didn't think I could say anything else. Thank you, Dad. I know that. And I know I want to be here with you. You need someone, and I think you're stuck with me. She smiled through her tears. We hugged again. I think I'd better go upstairs and talk to Ben. I'm sure it will be very hard for him to get over it. You said you told him about Mr. Morissette. Yeah, about a month after it happened, Ben said she was acting weird, and he noticed that Mom and I were kind of avoiding each other. I told him what I saw. How did he react? I asked. That's funny. Like it wasn't a big surprise. Or maybe he suspected something. Angie replied thoughtfully. I was sure he'd think I was lying, but he didn't say anything at all. He just mouthed off and kept it to himself. I nodded and stood up, heading for the stairs in Ben's room. I knocked softly, then turned the knob and gently pushed the door open. Ben was sitting the bed, staring out the window with empty eyes. It took a few seconds for him to acknowledge me, but he still didn't say anything. I'm sorry, Ben. You know, I wouldn't hurt you if I could help it. I hope you understand. I couldn't leave things the way they were, I said quietly. He nodded and turned to me. I'm sorry too, Dad. Mom really hurt a lot of people, didn't she? He said in a barely audible whisper. Yes. Yeah. I do not know what will come of all this, but I'm sure your grandparents be very upset with her, I replied. Why, Dad? Why? I have no idea, Ben. She's never once hinted to me that she's unhappy or dissatisfied with her life. Not a single hint, I repeated. I hate her, he suddenly muttered. No, no, do not do this, Ben. She loves you. You can be sure of that. It's something else. Something I do not understand. Maybe she doesn't either. But do not let your anger consume you. I know you love her. Perhaps in time you can forgive her. I know she would never want to hurt you or Angie. Never. I said in as positive a tone as possible. He turned to me again with a devastated look. I put my hand on his shoulder to reassure him. After a few minutes, I got up and left his room, closing the door behind me. After I woke up Sunday morning, all heck broke loose. Sheila tried to call home, but I got Angie and Ben, and we headed out for breakfast. We may not have had much of an appetite, but we needed to get out of the house. I also turned off my phone and asked Angie to do the same with hers. I didn't want Sheila pissing her off over nothing. I told the kids what I had done by calling early in the morning, and Angie laughed. Ben smiled, and I realized they approved. Why didn't I feel better then? After breakfast, we drove to the park by the river, and the three of us went for a walk. I think in some strange way, we all felt better. Perhaps because all the tension and anticipation of what was to come had subsided. Angie and Ben knew what was going to happen next, and they knew when it was going to happen. I myself had a knot in my stomach that would not dissolve. I was beginning the process that would end with the dissolution of my marriage and the breakup of my family. I still had to talk to my parents, but that was one of the two important things to do today. Of course, I would also call Lydia and tell her what I had done. I dreaded talking to George and Amy Pratt, Sheila's parents. We were close, and they adored their grandchildren. I wasn't sure how they would take the news or which side they would take. I decided to leave it at that until Sheila could decide for herself. She needed a place to live, and I suspected she would run home. I called Lydia Pancreas first. I told her about my little stunt, and she too laughed at my recklessness. Now that's something I'd never want to get. 
She grinned. I hope you enjoyed yourself, Mick. Not really. Cheap revenge, I guess. But now she knows. And she knows some of the consequences. I said, noticing the note of anger in my voice. How about the kids, Mick? I spoke to them last night, and I think things are stable. They're not very happy, as you can imagine, but they understand everything. And I think we'll have to wait and see what the long-term effects are for them. I said, but I have another surprise. What? Lydia was confused for a moment. Angie told me that about four years ago. She, her mother with another man. Sheila threatened Angie. She told her that I would divorce her, she would get custody, and they would never see me again. She blackmailed her into keeping quiet. I concluded, my God, could she have done that? Asked Lydia in amazement. I thought I knew her. I was wrong. I do not know her at all. She's just a disgusting woman. I said more with regret than anger. Lydia must have been wondering what to do next. After a few minutes of silence, she spoke again. Stay close to Angie and Ben. Mick, they need you to be there for them. It's going to be heck for them for a while. Be there for them, she concluded. Thanks again for your help, Lydia. As soon as I know where Sheila ends up, I'll let you know and you can serve her. We signed and I slammed my cell phone shut. It would be much harder to reach my parents. The conversation with my parents was mercifully short. I described the situation and their first reaction was concern for Angie and Ben. I recounted my conversations with them last night and how they seemed to be fine today. This seemed to reassure my mom, and both said they would talk to us later when things had settled down. I wondered when that would happen myself. I turned the phone off again. It beeped, saying it was waiting for a call, and I was pretty sure it was Sheila. She wasn't on my list to talk to today. Angie, Ben, and I sat down on a picnic bench in the park, and I explained that I didn't want to be near our house for the next few hours. I expected their mother to rush home to try to get in finding that her key was useless. She would surely make a ruckus. I suggested we go out of town and stay there until a late dinner and then come back. They agreed, and we talked about where we could go. There was an open-air affair in a small town a few miles south, and we decided to see what it was all about. The fair was very interesting and fun. We ate a few hot dogs to get us through dinner and overall enjoyed an old-fashioned country fair. It took our minds off our problems and allowed us to think about something else. We didn't get back into town until almost seven and stopped at a nice restaurant for dinner. We knew that sooner or later we would have to face changes in our lives. But on this last day, we could get away from it all and find some peace and quiet. When we got home, it was almost nine. Sheila was nowhere to be seen and the house was dark. I parked the car in the garage and we went inside turning on the lights as we went. Nothing had changed in the house since we'd left for breakfast that morning. The children went to their room and got ready for bed. I turned on the TV, but there was nothing interesting on, so I went to bed too. It was a restless night for me. I didn't know what tomorrow would bring. I knew that my phone call and serving the divorce papers would have consequences. It was only a matter of time. I reconnected the phones when I got up Monday morning. I didn't expect to hear from Sheila so early. I was wrong. Almost immediately, the phone rang. We didn't have caller ID, so I had no idea who would be calling this early. I decided to tempt fate. Hello. It was a cautious greeting on my part. Mick? Mick, please. We need to talk. I was Sheila. Of course. What is there to talk about? I asked in a low voice, trying not to disturb the children. My God, Mick. I'll tell you what I can explain. It's not what you think. She moaned. That's the second time you've said that. What do you think? I think I challenged. It wasn't like a, a novel. It was just a stupid mistake. Do not ruin our marriage over a stupid mistake. She pleaded. You must think I'm the stupidest person on the planet, Sheila. I know for a fact that you've been having fun with Butthole Gilson for a year, no less. And now I know that Francis Morissette is one of your buddies. We got pictures and all the proof we need. It won't be pretty, Sheila and you have no one to blame but yourself. I promise you, it will be ugly. With those words, I hung up and disconnected the phone again. I came to work and informed Larry Coleman that I was divorcing my wife, and if she called, I would ask him not to transfer the call. He agreed and immediately went to Gloria's switchboard to inform her of our request. I went back to my office and tried to burrow into the papers on my desk. 
Everything was going well until about 11 in the morning when the phone rang. It was George Pratt, my father-in-law. Good morning, George. I can guess why you're calling. I apologize for not warning you and Amy in advance, I said preemptively. I think I understand, but I'd like to hear it from you, Mick. You've always been straight with me. So tell me what the heck happened, he asked reproachfully. I recounted my warnings to Sheila about Gilson, what I had learned about her affair with him, and her other connection with Morissette. When I finished with a condensed version of her activities, there was a long silence on the line. My God, he finally said, slowly and softly. I had no idea she was capable of such a thing. Are you absolutely sure about that, Mick? he asked, hoping there was a glimmer of relief in his words. I'm very sorry, George. I'm afraid I'm not only sure, but I have photographic evidence. I said, feeling sorry for this fine man. He deserved better from his daughter. She's staying here for now. Mick, do you plan to start divorce proceedings? Yes. All the paperwork is ready. She'll be delivered either to work or... Well, I'm sorry, but it can happen at your house. I apologized. I understand. I do not mind telling you that this will hurt not only her, but her mother as well. I know it's not your fault, but... Well, it doesn't matter. I hope we'll still enjoy visiting the grandchildren. Mick, he finished? Hopefully. Of course it is. This isn't about you or Amy, George. I would never do that to you or the kids. You're always welcome here, I said sincerely. Thanks, Mick. I'm sorry. But thanks, he said sadly, and hung up when I put the phone back on the stand. I was emotionally drained. I expected there would be more moments like this in the weeks and months to come. I had to prepare for them. I learned that Sheila had gone to work that morning, and amazingly enough, had not yet lost her job. Gilson had no idea that all of this would come crashing down on his head at some point, and apparently decided to let things run their course. When Lydia confirmed that my wife was on time for work, she sent a bailiff over to her. And no sooner had she had her morning coffee than the divorce papers were in her hands. According to observers, she immediately broke down and ran out of the building. I believe she ran to her parents' house, but that wasn't the most interesting part. Shortly thereafter, Terry Gilson and Knox. Gilson were served with court orders stating my intention to sue for damages based on alienation of affection and willful disregard for corporate responsibility, namely failure to comply with the morals clause in specific employee contracts. The claims included punitive and compensatory damages in the amount of $5 million. Let the circus begin reconstructing the story. Much later, I learned that Knox Gilson had a showdown with his son Terry and practically cut him off no more. Easy jobs, no more rescue from situations with angry husbands, and if he didn't pull himself together, no more inheritance. Knox had indulged his son for the past 20-plus years and was finally at the end of his tether. Sooner or later, the sprouting teenager had to get back on his feet. Terry did the completely predictable thing. He went out and got drunk. Since he had been kicked out of the dealership, he had nowhere to go but to his townhouse. He disappeared into this cave for days. I knew the wheels of justice would turn slowly, foolishly. Sheila had decided to contest the divorce until Lydia provided her lawyer with the evidence we had, including photographs. That was enough to beat the heck out of her. Lydia would do her best to limit the amount of my financial punishment. But worst case scenario, she would get half of everything a reward for her perfidy. The week passed agonizingly slowly. I went to work, but I couldn't pretend to be efficient. Larry was very understanding and patient, but I knew this couldn't go on forever. I needed to think about my future as a single man and a single parent. It was a frightening prospect. On I was mowing the lawn in my backyard when I heard a commotion in the driveway. A car door slammed, and a few seconds later, I heard someone pounding on my front door. Neither Angie nor Ben was home so I walked around the side of the house and ran head-on into Terry Gilson. He looked like he'd been dragged behind a farm tractor for several miles. He was a mess. But at one look at his face, I knew it wasn't good. That was the last thing I remembered before he hit me with his big right fist. The next thing I remember was waking up in the hospital. I didn't really wake up, but I started to experience small bouts of unconsciousness. I was lying on my back, and felt a numbing pain from my head to my groin. 
Apparently, it took me over 24 hours to finally regain consciousness. I was floating in and out of consciousness, barely catching bits and pieces of the here and now. At some point, I realized that someone was next to me. I felt a hand, but I couldn't open my eyes, or at least I didn't want to. They were like two marbles rolling around in the bottom of a tin can. I heard a strange voice, but although it was familiar, I couldn't connect it to my memories to see who it could have been. I tried to remember what could have brought me to this place, and after a while, I remembered Gilson's face and then his fist. A day or so later, I found that my mom and Angie were at my bedside almost the entire time I was in the NICU. I tried to smile at them, but it hurt, and I hoped they realized how grateful I was to have them around. I think I heard Angie tell me Ben was coming over after school, and I tried to smile again just thinking about it hurt. It was over a week before I recovered enough to talk to my doctor. He started literally from the beginning. I had a concussion, the result of hitting the wooden frame of the garage door when Gilson hit me. I had a dislocated right shoulder and a badly bruised upper right arm. I had three and possibly four broken ribs. I had severe bruising of my kidneys and even more severe bruising of other internal organs. My testicles were badly swollen, and it was feared that I might lose one or both of them. Finally, I had my spleen removed when it was discovered that it had ruptured. My injuries were the result of a single punch from an enraged Terry Gilson, followed by systematic kicking as I lay unconscious on the ground. What saved me was that Felicia Romano, who had witnessed most of the altercation, screamed bloody murder from her kitchen window, causing Gilson to look up and realize he was being watched. He rushed to his car, backed out of our driveway, and rubber-tired the entire block. Felicia was smart enough to call 911, and that's how I ended up in the hospital. Gilson was identified by Felicia and another neighbor, who recognized his license plate number when he sped down our street, nearly hitting a mother pushing a baby stroller. There aren't many white 1964 Ford Galaxy convertibles in our town, and a couple of hours later, Gilson was seen leaving a bar and driving away in an inadequate manner. On top of all the woes, Gilson was arrested for DUI and resisting arrest. He just didn't know when to quit when they threw him in a cell. They matched the assault complaint filed by Mrs. Felicia Romano and my admission to the hospital after questioning Felicia. They charged Gilson with aggravated assault, assault with intent, and criminal trespassing. He was in deep crap and it couldn't have happened to a nicer guy when he called his father from prison. Knox Gilson didn't answer the phone. I wish I could have been there, but I was unconscious and lying on the operating table, having my spleen removed. Two days after I started having constant, lucid moments, a plainclothes officer came to me and asked me to testify. I told him everything I remembered, which wasn't much a face red with anger and a big fist. He asked what might have prompted the attack, and I told him about Terry's affair with my wife, the divorce, and the lawsuits. He nodded a couple of times and thanked me before leaving. Epilogue. The divorce property division judgment was not too favorable to Sheila. I will be buying her share of our house. They gave her the absolute minimum and no alimony, as well as an emphatic lecture on her contribution to my injuries. Knox fired both Terry and Sheila, she was on the job hunt when our divorce became final. Her name was toxic in some circles, and I doubted if she would ever find a decent job in our town. Ben lives with Sheila, but I understand from Angie that their relationship is not what it used to be. I see Ben every week on weekends. We got a break from the judge. He seems to be getting stronger, but he's not the same kid I remember from better times. Angie is Angie. She's my girl and makes sure I'm on top of things. She manages the house, my diet and exercise program. If I didn't know better, she could have been my mother. My folks have been a pillar of support and helped us when needed. They have no idea how important that was in the last few weeks. I just didn't need any more pressure. George and Amy, thank goodness, have remained friends. They are deeply disappointed in Sheila, but she is their only child, and they feel obliged to support her in her time of need. Having been around is a big plus for them. They are spoiling him in a way, but I do not mind. I just want Ben to get through this and come out of it in one piece. Angie stops by to visit. 
she and her mother talk to each other again, but I get the impression it's an awkward relationship at best. The lawsuits, of course, will never go to trial. Knox Gibson won't let that happen. According to my lawyer friends, Dave and Lydia will settle for a very large sum, and I'll be secured for years to come. Even after taxes and legal fees, I already know I'll be able to take care of Angie and Ben's college tuition and provide them with a car. At least some good will come out of this whole mess. Physically, I have recovered as much as I can at all. I lost my spleen, but my kidneys, ribs, and shoulder are almost healed. I go to physical therapy three times a week and will continue to do so for a while longer. I still have pains that come and go daily. The doctor thinks my testicles are 80% functional, but I haven't had a chance to have them tested yet. I really do not have much enthusiasm for the opposite love right now. When I have the money from the trial, I intend to buy Jimmy and Felicia something special. Jimmy has been there for me when I needed him, and Felicia may have saved my life. Nothing will be too extravagant for these two. What happens next? I ask myself regularly. I'm still reeling from what Sheila did to us but I suppose in time I'll get over the worst of it. I quit Polar Industries at least tried to. Larry didn't want to hear about it. Instead, he was giving me an indefinite leave of absence. Someday, I'd have a lot of money, and I was trying to decide what I should do with. It, I think I know. Frankly, one of my best customers, and an old friend from when I first started in sales, wants to retire and sell his building materials. Business. It's a good business with a well-balanced trade between retail and construction customers. He is part of the Build Right Buying Group, and that helps him compete with the big stores. Dave Murphy and I are going to meet with old Frank and see if we can make it happen. Ben was first in line to look for weekend and summer jobs when he found out about my plan. It doesn't make any difference. I want to keep him close and make sure he's okay while he gets through the next few years. Adolescence is hard enough as it is. And then there's the broken family. I look at Knox and Terry Gilson and realize that this is what happens when you are not involved or close enough in your children's lives. I've had a lot of time to think about what happened to me and our family. I'll be the first to admit that I took it personally and wanted revenge to the fullest. I still feel the same way. Perhaps if I had only had to deal with Gilson, things would have been different. I guess I can imagine how he might have swayed and charmed someone like Sheila. But when I learned about Morissette and how she blackmailed our daughter into silencing her, all thoughts, compassion, vanished. Dave says Terry will spend two to four years in prison for assaulting me. We talked about a civil suit as well, but there will be no one to sue his father disowned him. He has no job, no skills, and no prospects. When he gets out of prison, he will be in his early fifties, and a bleak future awaits him. There is nothing more we can do to hurt him. Amazingly, Knox Gilson came to me while I was in rehab. He apologized for everything that had happened and for his deadbeat son. I accepted his apology as sincere. He was well aware that the emotional damage his son had done to me was accompanied by physical damage. We shook hands, and I raised my opinion of Mr. Gilson Sr. a notch or two. And here you are. Sad story. I thought I had the perfect family. Heck, I was sure I had the perfect family. I can look on the good times we had together, or with anger. Maybe someday I can do the former, because right now I'm still dealing with the latter.